Anyway, without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, Holden. Holden sets the strategy for and oversees all long-termist cause uh, selection, prioritization, and grant making at Open Philanthropy, including its work on global catastrophic risks. He co-founded GiveWell in 2007 and began co-developing Open Philanthropy, initially called GiveWell Labs in 2011, um, which hopefully you can describe a bit of the history and story behind. Um, just as some signposting, we're going to start with the early years uh, trace the journey of Holden's thinking um, and uh, move to the most important century hypothesis. There might have been a bunch of words you have not heard of and don't know what those mean in the last two sentences that I just said, uh, which is why I am going to start with an audience poll. Uh, I'd like you to stick your hands up if you agree with this. Uh, and these are four questions. We're going to do the same poll at the very end. So question number one. I think future people matter a lot. And we should work hard to make the lives of trillions of people in the 2200s uh, better, uh, more than I think we owe much more to real people who are actually alive today. If you agree that the people in the 2200s matter more and that's what you want to work on, stick your hands up. Well, assuming there's more of them or not? Uh, <laughs> as, as, assume. Like a lot more of assume them. Assume a than lot more. Yeah. Assume a lot more. <laughs> this, this is what I was getting at. Yeah. 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 If, if you feel immediately that, no, I owe my work to the people alive uh, today, and that's what motivates me, stick your hand up. OK. Very interesting. Um, <laughs> question two. This is a multiple choice with probabilities. <laughs> if, I, if I was pressed. The probability that Homo sapiens will be extinct in the year 2100, either because uh, of catastrophe or we become post-biological, um, is more than 0%. Stick your hands up if you think it's possible that there's no more Homo sapiens. 1%? Ooh, interesting. 10%? These are lower bounds, right? Yeah, these, yeah. these are lower bounds. At like least, yeah. 50% means it's at least 50% probable we no longer exist as a species. When? 2100. Okay, okay. Uh, number three. I'm, I'm like pretty close to that. Like, okay. I mean, with some minor, there will be a few of us left. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, number three. If I, if I had $10 million and I had to give it to one organization, I would give it to, I'll give you the options. American Civil Rights Organization, Anti-Nuclear War Nonprofit, a team developing new vaccines, or uh, malaria bed net. Uh, a, American Civil Rights Organization, anti-nuclear war nonprofit, team developing new vaccines, malaria bed nets. Interesting. Okay. Good distribution. <laughs> do, do you want to answer that one stuff. or do you want to? I don't even know which one of those I would pick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one's not obvious to me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and the last one, I think trying to choose charities to donate to based on spreadsheets of lives saved per dollar catastrophically ignores hard to quantify impact on the obligations we have to people in our communities and not overseas uh, or in the future. And therefore, we should not try to do this. Do what? Give to charity? <laughs> <laughs> Spreadsheet driven, rational, calculating charity giving. Intra I will leave it there and give no further explanation. <laughs> Great. Um, with that said, look forward to the next poll. Uh, why, don't, why don't we start? Um, Holden, <laughs> welcome to SBC. <laughs> Thanks. I, I learned some stuff about the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was helpful. Um, I'm wondering if you can if you can uh, set the scene like uh, at the beginning, 2007 era. Give well. That's what was the beginning. The, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, at, yeah. At, at that beginning. What was the scene like? Uh, in terms of effective giving, who was involved? What was the general sort of idea, and where did GiveWell come from? Sure. Uh, yeah, in 2007, I mean, in 2004, I was like two years out of college, and I was working at uh, Bridgewater, which is a hedge fund, and I wanted to donate to charity. And I was like Googling, and I was like, I want to get the best deal for my money. I want to help the most people for the fewest dollars. And I was totally stuck. Um, and there was nothing. There was like no website that, that could even get me started on that. Uh, so I formed, I think, I think in 2004, I was just kind of like whining about it a lot to my friends. Um, and then around 2006, uh, my friend Ellie Hassenfeld and I both worked there, started a club. There was eight of us and we were meeting once a week and we were like, we're going to, we're going to do our estimates because we can't find anything online. 
Um, so there was, and then in 2007, Ellie and I left to go full time and turn this into Give Well. Um, and in terms of what was out there, I mean, there was like a website called Charity Navigator, which you might have seen. Uh, and their their entire, I mean, they've actually they've actually done more since then. Um, at that time, their entire system was was things like not exclusively, but things like you know, you're a charity, and the IRS makes you report how much of your money goes to like programs, administration, and fundraising, and they're scoring you by how much goes to programs, like what percent. Um, there'd be other measures like, do you have a lot of assets? Like, if you don't have a lot of assets, you might go bankrupt. That's bad. Um, and so I, yeah, I think this is like somewhat close to a non sequitur in terms of uh, what I was going for in terms of helping the most people for the least money. I mean, is it is it bad if you spend more on your administration? Does that mean you're hiring better executives? Does that mean you're building better IT systems? Is it bad if you spend more on fundraising? Does that mean you're just raising more money? Um, so I, yeah, I, is it is it good that you have a ton of money already? Maybe that's bad if I want to donate to you and do a lot of good. Um, so I did, you know, I emailed them and I was kind of like, is this, is this really all you guys do? And they were like, yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's the scene. Okay. And then your response to it and, and give well. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have this club and we would try to, we would try to just kind of call up charities and we were like, we're going to, we're going to try and find out which charity helps the most people per dollar. And we had kind of these different, eight different causes. Um, at one point there was, one charity where I was just like asking such specific questions that they got very suspicious that I was spying on them for another charity. <laughs> That's like how weird this was. Um, they they called like my boss's boss, Ray Dalio, and like tried to get me fired. Um, and we had like a really interesting meeting with them. So, uh, you know, that was <laughs> that was kind of the setting. And then uh, Ellie and I, uh, who were coworkers, we, we were like really, you know, interested in this. We were like, this is a giant hole in the world. We really want this thing to exist. It doesn't exist. We need to go full time. So. We quit. We immediately raised money from our former coworkers and our and our boss and everything, um, and we started GiveWell. And initially, uh, GiveWell, what we did is we we asked charities to apply to our grant making program. We raised like just enough to give five twenty five thousand dollars grants plus pay our salaries. Um, and we said that in order to apply for grants, charity would have to give us all this information that wasn't on their website, and then we would publish it and discuss how we chose the winners. Um, so that was that was the beginning of GiveWell, and that was two thousand seven. Um, and for the first, like, I think it was like four years before we hit, like, we tracked how many people gave to our recommended charities based on our recommendations. And I think it was four years before we hit a million dollars um, in a year. And uh, and then, you know, since then, GiveWell has grown a lot and now moves hundreds of millions of dollars a year. It, it has like a very small list of top charities. So it's more like the wire cutter than like consumer reports. So it's able to really know how much money went to the charities because of it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's estimating hundreds of millions of dollars per year. Wait, so I, I, I want to get you to expand a bit on like, I guess the, the, the framework of decision making and evaluation that you have. But first, like, it seems unique that you would do that in the first place. And another thing that seems unique is you were extremely transparent and high volume in what you wrote about what you were doing. Like, yeah. here's how we were thinking about this. Yeah. Why, why, why do you think that was, why did it happen with you guys in particular? Um, this sort of like transparency, extreme high volume of clear intellectual thought. Yeah, I think we were just trying to have a product that made sense, right? I mean, a lot of one of one of our funny early FAQs was like, "Why should I trust you guys? Like, who the hell are you? Do you know yeah. anything about charity? Do you know anything about global development?" We were like, "You should trust us because we're like writing up our thinking in a lot of detail." That's pretty much all we got. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. so that was yeah. We were just trying to say, hey, you know, we're we're doing the analysis. We're going to make the arguments like. You can judge how good the arguments are by reading our stuff. No one else will provide that. That's what we can provide. Um, we didn't have like credentials. We didn't have another way to get people to to think what we were doing was worth anything, or or to find out if it was, other than like putting our reasoning out there. Yeah. Okay. So it'd be interesting to chat about the reasoning then and how that's evolved all the way up to now, sort of tractability and um, yeah. importance and neglectedness and these kind of things. What have the sort of intellectual journey been? Was it clear from the start what sure. came out of it, and how do you think about this now? Yeah, the, the original GiveWell, we were very deliberately just not trying to boil the ocean. We were trying to, you know, start small and have one area of giving that we would focus on. And in fact, we got narrower at first over time, not broader. So when we started, we had like five different causes that we rated charities in. Uh, three of them were U.S.-based, two of them were overseas. And after about six months, we just pivoted and said, we're only doing overseas now. Um, and we were just kind of like, this is just better value for money. Um, didn't really expect that, and and um, we knew that you know we knew that poverty was worse overseas. Um, but I think the magnitude of of how different the giving opportunities really surprised us. It was kind of like 
the US charities would be like tens of thousands of dollars for like a year of some program, like school or some other program that might help someone. We really couldn't tell at all. Um, and then overseas, it's like $5 for a bed net that covers two people for like five years. Um, and you're estimating like a few thousand dollars per actual like infant death averted. So they, they were just in totally different ballparks. The quality of the evidence was completely different. I think that's because uh, when your money goes that much further, it's a hell of a lot easier to measure the effects. Uh, so, you know, sometimes people will, will say, well, you can't measure everything. That's true. You definitely can't measure everything. Um, but it's, it's also, an, I think, maybe an underlooked point or an overlooked point is that you, um, it's easier to measure things that are bigger. And so mm -hmm. if, you actually, uh, if you actually have a bias toward the measurable, you will actually pick up a lot of the biggest stuff. A lot of the stuff that's easiest to see becomes big. That's obvious. Um, so, you, yeah. What do, you, what do you mean by that as, a, as an example? Well, this is what I'm talking about is that, like, the, the, the overseas, like, the Africa-based charities tend to have better evidence bases than the U.S.-based ones because it's, like, easier to get a big effect. It's just, like, mm, cheaper. Got it, got it. It's cheaper to run a study and see what you're, what you're doing um, because you're getting, like, these big noticeable effects that are, like, harder to miss. Right. Um, so, I mean, it was, it was this whole picture. It wasn't just, like, oh, you know, you can buy a little bit more for your money. It was, like, these interventions are more robust. We're, like, buying people things they definitely need. Um, so we pivoted and we focused, you know, exclusively on basically global health and global poverty interventions for years. And then in 2012, we met Carrie Tuna and Dustin Moskovitz. Dustin is the co-founder of Facebook and Asana. And at that time, they had several billion dollars to give away, and they wanted to give it away within their lifetimes. And they said, you know, we've talked to dozens of people, ended up being hundreds of people, about how we can do the most good with our dollars. What do you two think? Um, and we, you know, we formed a really good bond with them right from the start and decided to partner with them. Uh, so we launched a thing called GiveWell Labs that was supposed to be sort of doing, I think Give, GiveWell was always meant to do this very transparent linear giving where we could argue the case for each piece and we could win over people we'd never met who were just coming to our website. And once we started working with Carrie and Dustin, we said they needed a different model. Um, they had their whole lives to spend on this. They had a ton of money. They could hire their own staff. Um, so we wanted to look more into kind of high risk, high reward, maybe more VC profile giving. Um, and so we launched a new arm of GiveWell called GiveWell Labs uh, in 2011 to do that, to serve them. And then that eventually grew into open philanthropy and split off into a separate organization in 2017 with me leaving GiveWell to lead it. Okay. So before going into labs and open fill, yeah. um, just something, I guess, like organizational principles behind GiveWell, I guess, both organizations. One, maybe, can you give an example of what is top recommended right now? So maybe maximum impact fund organizations yeah. or others. Then. Yeah, GiveWell, GiveWell's top charities are, like one of them is Malaria Consortium. Um, and uh, historically, one of their top charities, th things go in and out a lot based on like how much money they need and stuff. But um, it, malaria charities have been big. Uh, so originally, you know, when I was there, a lot, of, a lot of the time our top recommendation was against Malaria Foundation, which distributes these protective bed nets that kill mosquitoes and protect people from mosquitoes and have been studied in these very rigorous randomized studies um, that save lives. And then Malaria Consortium um, does a, a different thing, but it's also an anti-malaria intervention. So it's like this prophylactic medicine uh, during the seasons when the risk is high. Uh, so those are, those are examples. Uh, GiveWell no longer, its top charities no longer include deworming charities, but it still steers a lot of money toward them. So deworming is this kind of controversial intervention where you treat uh, school-aged children for intestinal worms. Uh, it's, no, nobody thinks this is bad. The question is, like, how good is it? That's extremely cheap. It's like a dollar to treat a child, and, and, like, you kill the worms. You might have to treat them once a year, maybe once every six months in very high-prevalence areas. But it's, you know, it's very, very cheap what you're getting. And then it's just kind of like, all right, we killed these intestinal worms. How much did that help the kid? Um, it's hard to pick up a lot of effects in the short run. Like you don't really see big improvements in, you know, BMI or anemia or anything like that. Uh, but there's this series of randomized or quasi-randomized studies that looks, uh, looks at the kids like 10 years later, 15 years later, 20 years later, and sees them earning a substantial amount more. Um, and so there's this theory, and also I think the school attendance improves in the short run. So there's this theory that, you know, something is going on that it, like you're, you're helping the kids with their health in a way they're able to pick up more from school or something else is happening, that they're like ending up with a little bit better lives and a little bit better lives for that amount of money is actually amazing. Um, so it's been very controversial and for years, GiveWell recommended deworming charities as among its top charities. And recently, I mean, I'm not there anymore, I'm on the board, but recently GiveWell has kind of said, okay, a lot of our donors really don't like these charities that are kind of like 
maybe it works amazingly well, maybe it doesn't, because it's only a few studies that say this, and if you pick the studies apart, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in them, like the, the year when they treated the children was during El Nino, so there were these unusually high rates of worm infections, and they tried to adjust for that, but it's all complicated. And so I think GiveWell has eventually come down and said, a lot of our donors just want something they are like, the evidence is really strong, they're sure it works. Not something where it's like, this might work, and if it does, it's really freaking amazing. Um, so GiveWell still directs a lot of money to deworming charities, but they don't have them on their official top charities list anymore. So those are two examples of the top charities. Perfect. Yeah. Um, the open fill evolution, which now I guess takes you to the current day. Um, general broad strokes, what is it and how did it happen? Yeah. And then why you over Alexander Berger for the, oh, I guess this is kind of cutting, jumping ahead to yeah. sort of the, the next iteration of it. Let's, yeah, let's talk about the, <laughs> the, the, yeah. the, the, open, the open fill um, yeah. uh, sort of evolution. Sure, the open fill evolution. So when we met Carrie and Dustin, I, uh, for various reasons, I mean, I, I've described kind of how the, the profile of someone spending their whole life giving away billions of dollars is different from someone spending a few hours deciding how to give away, you know, let's say $1,000. Um, or actually, a lot of people donors might give away 100000 or a million a year. It's still very different. They're still like, they're not like spending their lifetime giving away this massive fortune. Um, and so the, um, you know, the thing we wanted to do, I think we originally thought of is this like no holds barred version of Give Well, where it doesn't. It doesn't have to be evidence-based. It doesn't have to be something you can explain on a website. It just has to be like, helps a lot of people per dollar in expected value terms. So we wanted to open up ourselves up to everything. Um, one of the first things that we did was we, we tried to really study up on the history of philanthropy. And I kind of went into it very skeptical. I kind of, I, I thought there was a good chance I was going to like read, I was gonna like find all the foundation's biggest supposed success stories. And they were all gonna be really lame. And I was going to be like, okay, well, it turns out that maybe we should just distribute more bed nets. Maybe this mm. whole thing, because mm. a lot of people in foundation world, they'll talk about how they're, they're pioneers and they're doing high risk, high reward stuff and they're going to be innovative, but maybe they just suck at this because the feedback loops are bad at nonprofit and maybe we should just do bed nets. Um, that is not what I found. I was, I was actually just like completely blown away by some of the successes that foundations have had, just like these nonprofit philanthropies mm. that you would think would be kind of dysfunctional. And I think they often are. Um, but because there's because there's so much less money in nonprofit than for profit, I think there's crazy low hanging fruit, and they've been really effective anyway. Uh, just to throw a couple of my favorite examples out there, although there's many, um, one of them is the you know the Green Revolution is is probably one of the biggest events of the century, maybe history from a human welfare point of view. Uh, it's credited with a billion do billion people coming out of starvation, and this is basically directly traceable to the Rockefeller Foundation funding this like research on crop productivity in Mexico. Um, they were basically saying, you know, it would be cool if poor countries had better crop yields. Uh, mm. Just not a thing others were, that was not an in vogue thing to study at the time. It was not a thing governments were studying. Uh, they funded Norman Borlaug, who later won the Nobel Peace Prize. And these like, you know, these like hyper productive crops uh, have been credited with turning India, for, it, it spread across the world after it worked in Mexico, uh, credited with turning India from a wheat importer to a wheat exporter. And, and just like kicking off the development of all these very poor countries into middle income and rich countries. Um, and that's really just very traceable to the Rockefeller Foundation. Then another one of my favorite examples is um, a feminist philanthropy intervention. So there was a philanthropist named Catherine McCormick and she connected with a feminist named Margaret Sanger and they were funding this like obscure research on rabbit, rabbit reproductive cycles uh, because they were hoping they could form a contraceptive that just like a pill that women could take for birth control. Um, and that's exactly what they developed. And again, this is not a thing government was funding. This was not really an industry thing. Um, originally, according to a book I read on this, they had to, they were using the warning label on the pill as the advertisement. Uh, so they were saying like, it was being marketed as like a thing to control your period. And then it would say, you know, warning, you might not be able to get pregnant while you're taking this pill. Uh, so that was, you know, that was how they kind of had to advertise it. And um, this, this is another like momentous, momentous event of the 20th century that I think you could just directly say, you know, there was this research, it wasn't getting funded, it got funded. So that, that, that kind of moved me toward a, a new mindset on philanthropy where I said, you know, gosh, I mean, there's sometimes you can, you could, you could have a lot of embarrassing, expensive failures. And if you hit one of those, you would come out feeling pretty good anyway. Uh, so that's, that's when we started. We have a blog post called Hits Based Giving that describes the philosophy. We're open philanthropy. It's not the only kind of giving we do, but we do a lot of giving where we're just, we're willing to try something really crazy and just like fail nine times out of 10 if we get a few big hits. 
Um, and I would say after, you know, after like five years of open philanthropy at full force, I think that's worked out well. Like, I think, you know, we have all these grants, we have all this money spent, but if you ask me, Holden, what did you get for it? I would rattle off like five or 10 wins. And then you'd be like, cool. And what did all the other grants do? I'd be like, I have no idea. But the five or 10 wins for the, all the money we spent, that's a good deal. Yeah. So that is the philosophy. Um, yeah. OK, well, maybe maybe just put one of those in pressure. First, I'll, I'll ask, who had not heard of Norman Borlaug before Holden mentioned it? Do, this is not like a shame thing. Just like, oh, yeah. it's very useful. Like, yeah. lives per person save, seems like quite high in the case of Norman. Yeah. Um, but we don't really know about it. Um, OK, maybe to take an example. So OpenPhil had funded, uh, in the past, California YIMBY. Is that right? Yeah. So as, as an example. That would be one of our wins, I yeah. think. Yeah. OK, so, so maybe I, can, you, can you expand on that? So like, yeah. what is the case in 2022 for uh, you know, liberty and well-being and productivity in the United States, given the whole universe of things out there to donate to? Yeah, I mean, when we started off with open philanthropy, we were being very rough and, and exploratory. So instead of trying to calculate the good done by every cause or every grant, uh, we just use these heuristics. We'd say we want to work, and we still we still do this, but we would say we want to work on causes that fit three criteria, importance, neglectedness, and tractability. Um, so importance means that if we got a win, it could be a big deal, affect a lot of people. Neglectedness means it's not already a popular cause with a zillion dollars going into it. Tractability means we see like some kind of path, like it's not, not just something, you know, well, it would be great to stop an alien invasion. No one has a plan for that. Um, so, yeah. Um, would you fund it? Uh, if it was a good plan and we were otherwise going to get killed by aliens, probably. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, uh, we, 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 land use reform was one of them. It was one of these like causes that we explored. And we were just like, land use is, is really an underrated, I think now it's a little bit less underrated. But I think at the time we were like, gosh, it's actually like not a small deal at all. You know, like the most productive parts of the country and of the world are just like completely bottlenecked. You can't build more housing. You can't bring in more people um, because of like, you know, laws that say you can't. Um, and so we funded, at, at the time, we were just like, let's try making some grants to this cause. It was like a third of Alexander Berger's time, who's now co-CEO. Um, he was working on three causes that were of that basic thing. And the, the other ones were pretty good, too. Uh, one of them was macroeconomic stabilization policy, which we think was and is a very underrated factor in, like, the U.S. and global working class, just how, how their lives are going. is like, is, you know, is the Fed making good trade-offs about the economy? And then another cause was immigration. Um, which I think now is, is more of a hot button topic. But I think at that point we were saying, you know, it was, it was just a massive, massive, massive important topic where you could do a huge amount of good by, by allowing more immigration into rich countries from poor countries. Um, so he was working on all three. And he would just make these like grants that were just like, you know, this is kind of interesting. This person's kind of interesting. And, and this cause is like really important. So we're going to try it. So one of our first grants was to a group that was called SF BARF, uh, Bay Area Renters Federation. Uh, and that was like, I think basically the first, might have been the first grant uh, that was made to a YIMBY organization. They weren't called YIMBY at that time. And then CA YIMBY, I think, was you know, partially spun out of that. And we funded CA YIMBY as well. And so we were, you know, I think we were the first institutional funder of the YIMBY movement. Um, and so, I, yeah, I think the return, on, the return on that money looks quite good compared to most things you could do. Is it the number one thing? I mean, we can get to that because I've, I've kind of gotten narrower again. I can't, we kind of go broad and then we go narrow. Um, and it's not the top cause on my list anymore. But we did it in this exploratory mode. And I think we did get, you know, we did get some hits from doing that kind of stuff. OK, so we've heard some frameworks here. One, the basic framework of like, maybe we should maximize impact. I think that's, that's like non-trivial as a thing. Um, importance, importance, tractability, neglectedness, hits-based giving, a sort of portfolio approach as well. Does anybody immediately have a kind of uh, averse reaction or like a, a sort of case that makes them feel like this could be wrong? And would you please share it if, if you do? Anybody out there? I will. I, I mean, won't be offended. Yeah, yeah I mean, this, this is deliberate, this I think. Really yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sonia. Yeah, um, I mean, the first thing is cool, but the second thing is like creating a monoculture. Like yeah. people are incentivized to conform to each other. Um, oftentimes, people have like their own like priors or like emotional motivations that can actually create like, a distributed like bottom up computation. So get the more bottom up like recursive morality versus like a top down morality. This can actually be more robust. Like for example, like this isn't directly like this philosophy, but say I'm thinking about you know trillions of lives in the future. Um, like that's like abstract in many yeah. ways. Um, but if everyone just like cared about like their nuclear family and like generations after, 
your that's more in line with like my randomly evolved biology, which is like somewhat yeah. random and like not rational, and that actually might be a more robust algorithm than this like top-down thing. But I still think it's yeah. cool. Oh, thanks. Um, no, I mean, I, I agree that's an issue. I mean, I, I wouldn't want, like, I kind of want to say two things. I mean, I, I would want to say one, like, I think it would be really bad if everyone just tried to take all their money and, like, maximize impact with it according to a spreadsheet. Um, like, you're absolutely right that people just are better at helping, dealing with situations that are in front of them, helping people they know, than helping people across the world. And then I also want to be like, okay, but you're carrying Dustin, what do you do? Like, are you really, like, okay, you got, like, at that, at that point in time, they had several billion dollars to give away, now they're in the double digits of billions. It's like, okay, so give it all to my mom? Like, I mean, it just, um, it's, it's at the point where the, you know, the resources you have are just beyond what you can use or need to solve problems right in front of you that you understand. And so that is a lot of what effective altruism is targeting, is it's frankly targeting people who have some slack um, and are wondering what to do with it. That, that's how I like to think of it. And I, I wouldn't want, you yeah, know, I wouldn't want a world where everyone is just like grinding themselves up to benefit the theoretical people on the other side of the earth. But we do have a society with a lot of people who have choices they can make that are, you know, they have many different ways they can go, many different careers they can take that would all pay them well and give them a nice life. You know, lots of dollars they have that they could give to charity without much impact on what they're able to do as a person. And, and that is mostly who we target. Yeah. The, uh, um, I, th I think it was asked on, it was on the Dustin Moskowitz uh, AMA a couple days ago. Yeah. Um, was it, would you rather have like, uh, another billionaire or a politician uh, advocating like for your cause? Right? Yeah, yeah, or three senators. What, what would you choose in this case? Uh, well, actually, I don't remember exactly what it was. So the one I just said, probably the senators. Let's say three senators or one more billionaire donor to Openfill that commits all their money to sort of the Openfill way of thinking. How many? How many billions? <laughs> uh, let's 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 go two to start. Two, 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 two to start. I would take the three senators, but I, I might give you a different answer if, if you handed me like a spreadsheet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Senators giving money or senators implementing Ad, this? Just like people who are converted. like, what I want yeah. to do as much as I can is help you know help do the most good possible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's talk about the, the evolution to the next phase, uh, right? Like you're the near-termist to long-termist. Yeah. Um, maybe, um, is, if, if, nod your head if you have no idea what sort of long-termist means. Okay, okay. <laughs> it'd, be, it'd be good to maybe give a very quick sort of like uh, yeah. overview of that and what the hell that is. Yeah, um, okay, so this is gonna get kind of weird now. So, um, <laughs> Great. the... Um, you know, basically, as, as through work at Open Philanthropy, I became very professionally interested in finding neglected great opportunities to give money. And I've definitely become acclimated to the idea. I mean, one of the most important criteria is neglected. Um, I think that, you know, a lot, you can get really far with causes that do not already have everyone all over them. Um, so I, um, I became very interested in that. And I started interacting with the rest of the effective altruist community, which didn't really exist or have a name in 2007, but now does. Um, and so I have been just like on the hunt for now for, you know, for 15 years for just like, what are the biggest opportunities to help a lot of people that are going undone? Um, and there's two intersecting ideas that I've run into. And I think for my, for some people, it doesn't matter. For me, it's very important to kind of keep them separate and they're very easy to confuse. So one of them is called long-termism. And that is the basic proposition. It's like, do you want to help a lot of people, which is our thing, we want to help the most people for the least money. Well, guess where there's a lot of people? The future. Um, there's like way, way, way more future people than present people, at least potentially, at least hopefully, at least if you are doing an expected value calculation. So if you're, you know, if, for example, if there was a 30% chance that there will be a gazillion people in the future, that's kind of in expected value terms a lot more than are alive now. So if there's anything you can do today that will be more likely, that will be, be likely to help people who live all the way in the future, that's like one of the best ways to help a ton of people for a little money. Now, initially when you hear that, it probably sounds like, okay, that sounds like kind of logical, but how the heck, heck would I know what's good for people a gazillion years from now? Um, and I think the answer is mostly like you wouldn't, mostly just we have no idea, and, and mostly there's not that much you can do with this idea, but there's a few things that seem like they might be. Um, so the easiest example is just anything that drove humanity extinct would probably be a pretty lasting change and something that I feel okay saying would be a bad change. Um, and so even, you know, this is a case of most things I would not be, I would not be happy to say, well, I'm gonna wanna root for this political party a million years from now. I wouldn't be happy to say that. But I think I feel pretty good saying if humanity went extinct, that would be bad and the people affected 
millions of years from now by not getting to exist, uh, would that would be a bad thing, and that would be a real impact. So long-termism is this kind of, it's this philosophical point that there's an enormous number of people in the future, that we should care about them, that they don't have a voice in the decisions we make now, and that we should be making decisions now to the extent we can that will benefit them. And one of the ways you could do that is by, you know, is by minimizing the chance that the human race goes extinct. And so even if you were to make a tiny, you know, an 0.0001% reduction in the odds that we go extinct, that's effectively helping some crazy number of people. Um, so that's long-termism. There's another, there's another thing uh, which doesn't get as, as clear or as crisp of a label. You could call it the global catastrophic risk reduction community or the hinge of history hypothesis. And it says, um, it says we are living in a really weird century or a really weird time period. Um, for almost all of human history, we have not, it has not been on the table for humans to go extinct or it's been just incredibly unlikely. It has to be an asteroid or something that we know almost never happens. Um, starting around, you know, around 70 years ago, it started to come onto the table with nuclear weapons that humans could maybe drive ourselves extinct. And now we're reaching this crazy period where technology is advancing so fast and becoming so powerful, we might actually build the ability to, you know, to, to drive ourselves extinct or to change the world in other very permanent ways, like to, you know, create a surveillance system that could allow someone to have total power over the world or over a country like forever without dying or something, um, or to create AI that would allow that. And so we're, we're getting into this point where we have the technology to do these horrible things or create these irrevocable outcomes, and we haven't kind of matured as a species enough yet that we have any sense of whether that's gonna happen or not. And so we live in this crazy time period where we face these giant risks that could affect everyone on the planet and everyone in the future, and we should be very attentive to those. Um, these are different ideas. They sound very similar. Uh, but the first one, so long-termism is starting by saying there's so many people in the future that even a very tiny impact on global catastrophic risk would be worth it. The second one is saying, no, global catastrophic risk is really big. It's so big that you don't have to care about the future anymore. Um, and, I, and I actually believe there's a decent case that you, um, you don't need to have unusual views about future generations in order to make a case that, for example, reducing the risk of a globally catastrophic pandemic or a globally catastrophic AI deployment actually is the best way to help the most people per dollar. Um, and it's because the risk is big enough and because it would affect that many people that we don't have to get into exotic arguments about a zillion future generations. So um, I believe both things-ish, but I actually believe the second one more. Uh, so if it was, if it was all my money and, and I was just deciding how much to give, I would give some based on that first point, the long-termist point, um, but I trust that point less, I trust that argument less, and I have become like more solidly convinced that actually we just live in this very strange time when global catastrophic risks are very high, and so even if we're not making weird arguments with the future, that's what I think we should focus on. Um, and that is my best guess at like the single way to do the most good. And so what we, what we did recently is we, uh, and promoted about a year ago, promoted Alexander Berger to co-CEO of Open Philanthropy. And I now only work on two and a half causes, work basically on the, the two biggest things I consider global catastrophic risk, so AI risk and bio risk. And then the half a cause is meta. So a half a cause is like growing the community of people who are trying to do the most good possible, including by working on these things. And then he runs everything else at Open Philanthropy. Okay, let's, let's expand on that. But first, I'm wondering if anybody at this point, without any further expansion, maybe you've heard of this area. Or so it's, it's, does anyone just want to walk out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, does anybody have want to like throw out a strong take of like either I think you're wrong or we don't really know these things in the first place, so it would be misplaced to to go after it. What do you think? Anybody principled disagreements with it? Yeah, Sam. I don't know a disagreement. It's more of a question or comment. Um, that we kind of already see like surveillance systems at play deployed in countries like China, for example, like the, the digital money system yeah. and the COVID passes. Like there's a lot of linkage of all this stuff. So this is kind of already happening now in some ways. Do yeah. you guys work on causes like that or just kind of more theoretical work? I mean, I think that's a good example of something where if you, if you drew a chart of like, how close are we getting to one person being able to kind of control everyone's lives forever? That chart is like kind of low, but going up. Um, and I, uh, I think the most likely way it would like go up surprisingly fast would be the development of very advanced AI systems. So um, that is like, that is, you know, one of the causes that I work on. Um, most of what I work on with AI is not targeted at that, but some of it is. 
The, uh, I, would, I would encourage everybody, maybe, do you want to talk very briefly and explain uh, just the set of essays that is the most important century yeah. hypothesis? Yeah, so the, so the centerpiece the centerpiece of this global catastrophic risk view, so I think you could make this case just for pandemics, which I won't get into as much, although we do have a significant uh, pandemic preparedness program. You could make this case for nuclear war. You could, you could somewhat make this case for climate change. Um, but I, I do believe that the number one thing that's most likely to happen this century in a way that matters like forever or matters for the whole world would be the development of advanced AI systems um, that can basically could do everything that humans do to advance science and technology. Um, and so the basic argument there, and so I've, I've become convinced this is like my best guess at the most important cause to work on, even though in many ways it's a terrible cause to work on because it's very confusing and a lot of the things that you would first think of doing might actually be bad. So there's, there's a lot of bad things about working in this cause, but I think it, it overall is where I should be putting my time. Um, and so I wrote a series of blog posts on, on this blog I have called Cold Takes that I update now very occasionally. I did have it going regularly for a while. Um, that is called The Most Important Century and was basically arguing that if we develop AI with particular capabilities, that would be pretty likely to make this the most important century of all time for humanity. Um, and it argues that actually developing that kind of AI system looks more likely than not this century. So if you put those two together, you have a pretty good case that we could be in the most important century of all time, that AI would be the reason for that, um, and that that's what we you know, ought to be focusing on to the extent we can be productive. Again, I think the, the, average, the average thing someone would try to do with help with AI, I think, would either not work or would be bad. So I think it is like kind of a tricky cause, but um, it's one that I work on anyway. And so the, the basic cases I would lay it out um, is first off, you know, humans have transformed the planet an awful lot via our ability to advance science and technology, to do science, make new technologies. That's not something that anyone else in the universe can do as far as we can tell, uh, or in the galaxy anyway, and what we're able to observe. It's not something other animals can do, and it is the source of like why we are doing all this crazy stuff on the planet, to the planet, around the planet. Um, and the, the question is like, what would happen if you had an AI system that could do all the same things humans do in terms of like generating new proposals for experiments and doing R&D and designing robot factories or whatever it's doing. Um, and so I abbreviate that kind of AI as a process for automating scientific and technological advancement. So the acronym is PASTA. And I talk about, yeah, um, I talk about like what, what we should expect if that happens. And so there's a couple of key points. Um, one is that if you, if you just take a chart of the size of the world economy, and you zoom all the way out to as far away to as far as we have data. Most charts you'll ever see of this stuff go back like 200 years because that's where we have most of our data. Um, 200 years is really the blink of an eye. The human race is like, or human civilization is thousands of years old. Um, if you zoom out all the way, what you'll see is a line that is accelerating in this super exponential way. Um, it's not just an exponential curve. It's like this explosive growth trajectory where. Um, you know, even if you kind of try to adjust the graph for exponential growth, it still looks like really weird and jumpy and like it's accelerating. Um, and the, the basic thought is that if you just kind of blindly extrapolate out where the economy is going, where the size of the economy is going, you take the acceleration we've seen in the past and project that acceleration into the future, you would reach the conclusion that the economy hits infinite size sometime this century. Um, that's what the naive projection would say. And then there's a reason to think that's not right. Uh, there's a few reasons to think that's not right. Um, one reason to think that's not right is that things have slowed down. Things have stopped accelerating in the last couple hundred years um, with the leading theory being that the demographic transition is the reason why. So I'll try and explain that. So basically, um, the, the, the leading theory that I think a standard economic model would tell you and that looks kind of right to me is that for most of our history, you have a feedback loop where human beings have ideas and because they have ideas, they have more resources. Because they have more resources, they're able to support more humans. Population goes up. And so you have the population goes up, research goes up, wealth goes up, then the population goes up, then research goes up, then wealth goes up. When those things are able to operate in a cycle, they feed themselves, you get this explosive trajectory, um, and it's the kind of trajectory that can hit infinity. Um, however, what happened a couple hundred years ago is that one of the parts of that cycle broke, uh, which is that people stopped having enough children to use all the resources, basically. So it's like we were, we had more resources, but that wasn't resulting in some ha having more people. Now when people are richer, they often have fewer children, not more children. And so the, the crazy thing about this like pasta idea or this AI idea is they could bring back that part of the loop. 
because if you had AI systems that were doing the research, now you're back in a world where every time you have more resources, you could build more AIs. Um, the, the key thing about an AI that could do what humans do is that you can copy it. And every time you have more money or more resources, more servers, you could just make more of them. So that leads back to this feedback loop. And so according to any standard economic theory, and we've really canvassed the literature on this to see if there's any way around this, and, and have mostly been like not really, um, or only sort of, um, you know, in, it, according to a basic economic theory, AI that's able to automate the human role in science and technology should cause just a crazy <coughs> explosion in science and technology. Because you get this feedback loop where you have new ideas, then you're able to have more resources, then you have, have more AIs, the AIs are having ideas, so then you go around again. Um, so that is why I think the development of something like pasta would be so momentous. Um, and then there's a separate analysis that I present in the blog post series that I won't get all the way into the weeds of here, but I, you know, I also think that that kind of AI is more likely than not to arrive this century. Um, one of the basic, a couple of the basic arguments for that, one would be um, if you just look at how much effort has gone into building AI systems, it's like most of the effort that has ever happened in the history of human civilization will almost certainly be this century. Um, so that's just like an interesting fact. We're just like really early in the journey toward this kind of AI. Um, there hasn't been that much effort put in so far. Resources are exploding now. And then another point, there's some other points that I think are important. If you survey experts on AI, they're all forecasting it this century. I don't think it's a huge data point, but it's kind of confirmatory. Um, and then also if you kind of do this analysis where you, you ask like, what would it mean for an AI system to be doing as much computation as a human brain? And how much would it take to train that kind of AI system? There you also, like basically any way you estimate it, you would kind of guess that it would happen this century. Um, and so that's, that's like the, 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 the in a nutshell, um, that, that the world could be transformed so dramatically that we could actually hit the limits of our economic growth um, and end up in a deeply unfamiliar future and that all that, when you imagine a crazy sci-fi future that's 10,000 years from now, you might actually be imagining a sci-fi future of like 10 years from now um, if we develop AI that automates the process of science. Um, and I believe that could be coming within this century. So that's, that's something I've, uh, I've, I've you know, decided to prioritize, just saying, okay, if we're about to build this incredibly powerful thing that speeds up science and technology, we want that to go well, not poorly, and I don't think a lot of people are trying to get out of ahead of that. Think about some of the pitfalls, uh, which I can get to next. Um, a final point I just want to make, and then I'll, then I'll stop talking, I'll take a breath, um, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, a big part of the series, I think like for, for years I heard this argument, I started hearing in like 2008, and for years I was saying, you know, this is all very interesting, but it's just too much, it's like too wild, it's too weird, it's like, it would be such a weird coincidence if I happen to be born into this incredible time, it's more likely that we're telling ourselves stories that we want to hear about how important we are. Um, that would be a more likely way you would get the observation of thinking that you're in an important time. Um, I spend a lot of the series arguing against that reaction uh, because I think actually without knowing anything about AI, you can make a lot of very robust arguments that we just should already think we're in a super weird time, a uh, very privileged time, a very, like, if humanity ever fills the galaxy, we are among the very first humans ever um, and are in a tiny, tiny fraction of humans that are like, you know, pre-galactic expansion. Um, and so I think there's just already like a lot of reasons to think that we live in a very strange and very privileged time and should be thinking about what kinds of things could influence, you know, the long run future, could influence the whole planet at once. Uh, we should be paying more attention to those things than we do today. Okay, there's a lot there. I'm gonna get responses after because I gotta ask one last question yeah. before we go to uh, sort of bring everybody in. Um, I encourage first everybody to go check out Most Important Century. Uh, you can check out coldtakes.com. What is yeah. it? Cold-takes.com. You can also just Google Most Important Century. Cool. Um, There's not like 10 of these. The, the, <laughs> the, the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the last question, um, what do we build to uh, within within the Holden Karnofsky worldview yeah. to do good thing, what does not exist yet that needs to be built? SPC yeah. is a space about building. Um, you could you could make the strong case that we do the opposite and we try our best not to build anything. Um, but what, what do we build? What would you what what open fill would you want to fund to fulfill more of what you think is the yeah. moral framework? I, I am like significantly on the page that we're just not ready for this and it would be good to like have more time. Uh, you know, if we're if we're yeah. especially I think there there are you know but I make the case it's more likely than not this century. There's plenty of people who believe we're like we got ten years or something. If you see, you know, how fast these AI systems are progressing now, how simple the methods are, how much low-hanging fruit there is left, 
um, just how many things people haven't even started trying to make these models better. Uh, so I think if it's, you know, if, we're, if we might have 10 years or 20 years, I'm just like, that's not enough time. No one's like ever thought about what we would want this kind of AI system to do and what we might be worried about and how we would want it to be used and who we would want it to be used by. So a significant part of me just wants more time. And if, so, you, if you yeah. had to fund one thing, because oh, sure. we'll, we'll get into this stuff. Well, I mean, there's, there's, a lot of things I, there's a lot of things we do fund, and there's a lot of things I want to fund. That you, um, you want to fund that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, just I, I think it would just be helpful if I just rattle through some of the, some go, of the things we do try it. to fund. I mean, we, we do fund a lot of like AI alignment research. So this is something that I'm going to be writing more about on the blog that I, I have written about some and, and um, have some guest posts on. But I think this, you know, there is a real reason to think, especially with the way today's machine learning works, that if you just train a super powerful AI by default, you get something that has like its own goals that you didn't intend to put in there. Um, and now it's like more powerful than you because it can develop its own technology. And now like that's like kind of a worst case scenario. Just like what's the worst thing that could possibly happen to humans would be to have something that's like not human at all, has totally different goals from humans, and is able to do all the stuff humans do to invent science and technology. Um, so that is like a lot of my focus on AIs. I think this is like a very underappreciated aspect of this problem. So one of the things we fund and that I want to fund more of is research and understanding of how to avoid that problem. How do you build something that is in some sense more capable than you, that sees a lot of things you don't, that is able to make plans and calculations and predictions that you're not able to make, but that what it's doing is just helping you out instead of pursuing some goal of its own once it spins out of control and you can't get it back. Um, that is like an active technical field. There's academic work on it. Uh, a lot of the major AI labs have like large teams that work on this problem. There's work happening outside of academia that we just fund at you know, random institutions. So that's a big thing. Um, I'm also, this may not be the coolest thing to talk about at South Park Commons, but I'm interested in you know, regulatory frameworks, both legal and just like self-regulation frameworks. So, a thing I'd love to fund that doesn't exist yet, although I am like, you know, talking to some people about, about experimenting with it and starting with it, is like an organization that tries to set standards for AI companies and for AI researchers and says, here's how you're gonna know if your AI is dangerous enough that you need to stop. Um, because if you have 10 different companies, they all wanna beat each other and no one wants to be the one who slows down and says, this is dangerous, so I'll just let the other guy kill everyone um, or let, you know, let, let my competitor win the race. But if you had kind of a, you know, a trusted third party that's setting standards for everyone, I think that could solve a lot of the coordination problem and a lot of the coordination bottlenecks. So I do feel a lot of the problems here, a lot of the challenges here are theoretical, are scientific, are regulatory, are kind of, you know, coordination, nonprofit shaped problems. I, um, if I, if I had to do a for profit, I think that's like yeah. a little. A little hard. I, I was uh, I was thinking of examples because I saw your questions, but I think for AI in particular, um, I mean, like one thing it, it could, do, could be biosecurity, it could be other yeah, things, yeah. but well, I mean, there's definitely there's tons of for profits and other in other causes. I mean, like an obvious one would be just better and better alternatives to meat. Uh, we haven't talked at all about animal welfare, but it's one of Open Philanthropy's biggest programs and I think biggest successes. That's another case where you just have like very very large numbers of creatures that probably uh, probably deserve some moral consideration being treated horribly. Um, we have invested in, in attempts to come up with alternatives to meat, like the Impossible Burger. And yeah. the better that stuff gets, I mean, that's going to be profitable and I think also going to make a huge difference for ca carbon emissions, for the climate, for a lot of things, and for animal suffering. So, you know, that, that would be a for-profit. If I had to do a for-profit in AI, maybe, um, I mean, I think an interesting thing would be that if we could get a sea change in popular perception and understanding, if we could build a society-wide consensus that we are moving too fast, and that AI systems are dangerous, uh, it might then become very profitable to make AI systems safer. Mm. Uh, and so I think that that's an interesting kind of like one, two that I'm considering. I think as long as, as long as people see AI as cool science that we should push forward as fast as we can, it's a little hard for me to come up with profit opportunities that I'm very excited about. Uh, but if the basic ground rules changed, so I think it could be interesting to, to you know, th this is kind of a bad word in nonprofit world, but, but I think it's real here. Raise awareness, help people understand. Um, help people understand what the dangers are. Help people get what we need to be avoiding. And if we got to that world, I think it might become, it might be, there might be big profit opportunities for AI labs that we're able to prove what they're doing is safe because that might become the big bottleneck 
to deploying these very powerful systems. I'm just going to point out, uh, Mike McCormick in the back there is an effective altruist venture capitalist. Is that the right like four-word tagline? Sure. That's, I think it works. <laughs> if, if you are doing something in this area, uh, you should talk to Mike if you are interested in high-impact operation. It doesn't have to be a company. It have to it be just. It's nonprofit, it's policy work. Um, quick lightning round, then we should have a yeah. chat. Um, one word answers to each of these four questions. Um, one word? One word. <laughs> you'll, you'll get what I mean. I might just cheat. You get, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if there was a mechanism in a way, uh, would you throw all of the money that you currently have sort of you know, control over uh, to stopping AI progress altogether? No. Do you want me to explain it? Or just no. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Does EA have too much money? No. Uh, is progress studies net good or bad? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the words good and bad, which one, which one is it? I'm going to guess good, but I think okay. there's, there's a lot to be, yeah. <laughs> which non-traditional, non-Silicon Valley billionaire do you wish was another open fill patron? Uh, like Larry or Sergey. OK. Yeah. Um, also, one word answer to this, last one. How do you write so much? I don't write that much. Uh, <laughs> okay. I, have it, I, had, I had my blog going at a good pace for a while. It's been a few months. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was, uh, for a while, I was like doing that on weekends, and then we had a kid, so that's basically Cool. Right. Yeah. So the answer is, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. Anybody want to bring out of everything that has been said, there were a couple hands that went up that we had to uh, ignore. Um, challenges, thoughts, hard questions. Maybe people haven't, haven't spoken. Actually, you had your hand up earlier, so. In the front here, in the front. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, I wanted to get your reaction on this. So um, I'm borrowing this idea from a book that I recently read. Uh, it's called 4,000 Hours. And it talks about um, how <coughs> science and technology are a great way to improve the material quality of our lives. Mm -hmm. But they also have a tendency to increase the expectation we have for the quality of our lives. And I think this book has some like Buddhist inspirations. Yeah. And the idea is like, Suffering is the result of a gap between expectations and reality. And um, to the extent it's true that science and technology advances or increases our expectation, I wanted to get your reaction on, like, do you, does effective altruism have room for something that lowers expectation or maybe like spreads some version of Buddhism, basically? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a few thoughts on this. I mean, if there are some effective altruists who are interested in this. There's something called the Happier Lives Institute that's very focused on, like, subjective happiness instead of material wealth. Um, a lot of effective altruists, including myself, are less focused on that stuff. One is I'm just like, you know, going extinct would be really bad. Let's like try to focus on that or focus on, you know, how to avoid some locked in really bad future from AI. Um, I think, you know, another thing that might be interesting to people is I, I wrote another series on my blog, Cold Takes, called Has Life Gotten Better, where I really try to just like go through all the data we have on like, what actually has happened as we've gotten richer? Like, have we gotten happier? Um, have we gotten better off in other ways? Have our expectations just adjusted? And, you know, I think I, I came out feeling like, like both of the common narratives are kind of not quite right, where the, the narrative that life has just consistently gotten better through all technological progress doesn't look quite right. Um, but it does look over the last couple hundred years, which is where most of the tech progress is, life has mostly gotten better. And there's a lot of things that are just like, yeah, a, lo a lot of things where I would just say like, they're really cheap and tractable to solve like hunger and disease that I just, I feel really good about addressing hunger and disease. Even if like, frankly, even if like not being hungry and having good health just causes you to adjust your expectations, it doesn't make you happier. I think I'd still be like, let's still get rid of hunger and disease. Um, and that is a lot of what like GiveWell does. And I think that that is still a worthy goal. But I, I think this goal is worthy too. It just all comes down to how much value can you get for how much money? I do a super quick follow up. Who are some of those uh, effective altruists who are trying to focus on the other side of the equation? Yeah, if, if you Google Happier Lives Institute, that's going to be the place to start. Yeah. Tamia? So if we're very short on time in terms of uh, existential AI risk, yeah. um, but we still have a lot of bodies. What do you think of a medium termist perspective that really tries to strengthen math education, get everybody training models and yeah. bringing their, the diversity and the human worldview into this? Is that something that you guys are thinking about? And if not, why? Is it, is it just too big to bite off? I find AI really tricky because of the fact that anyone's default reaction to AI is important is let me go build big AI systems. Um, and I think I just like am pretty convinced that the world is not ready for this. So that's like, 
that's the reaction that I'm not really that excited about getting people to have, which is why I try, try only to talk about this stuff in places where I'm able to make both points. Like AI could be a big deal and AI could be really dangerous and we should be careful here. Like we're dealing with something bigger than ourselves. Um, so I think like, I really wish we lived in a world where it was just like really widely understood what some of the risks are of AI having goals of its own and having unintended consequences. In that world, I would be very excited about like getting everyone to see what a big deal it is. Uh, in the world we're in, it's more of a delicate balancing act. And I think in the world we're in, I'm not currently in the market for ways to get more people into AI. Uh, I'm in the market for more ways to get people into responsible AI, beneficial AI, AI safety. Yeah. Yeah, in the front, and then Sam. Yeah, so uh, I have I got so many questions. Uh, I'm pick one. So um, I want to poke a little bit at this thesis of yours that, uh, you know, for lack of a better phrasing, AI is maybe dangerous in a sense, right? Yeah. I'm not quite sure I follow why you believe this because yeah. you know it's there's a huge spectrum of what we mean by that statement, even right. Yep. But it seems to me that. Um, if we actually do crack, like, you know, the whole AGI thing, right, we actually are able to make these beings that are not human, why is there this underlying assumption that they are going to be all out to kill us, number one, yeah. right? Number two, it sort of just does, like, strike me that, uh, you know, it's almost like a human, uh, human chauvinism almost, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying you're saying that, but it's almost like we're assuming the absolute worst on these beings that don't even exist yet. Yeah. Right? So why the automatic thinking there, if that's indeed what you mean? Yeah. No, I think it's a great question. I think it's super non-obvious. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's automatic. I mean, I think it's super non-obvious what happens if you build something that is like got its own ability to shape the world how it, how it would calculate or how it would choose to do so. Um, the reason that I do think things are dangerous and that I think we should be very careful is mostly that I've just tried to play out what happens if the things we're doing today to make to build AI systems just end up going all the way to these hyper-capable AI systems? What would you expect to happen if that's how things played out? Um, and I think basically we're, we're training AI systems by trial and error. So it's like what we're doing is we're basically taking these systems, we're giving them like positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement for different choices they make. Um, and the trial and error is just like inherently mistargeted and sloppy. And so what I believe, and I'm, I'm going to go into this in a lot of detail in a, in a cold takes post probably like in a few weeks, um, if not sooner, is that the, there's a really good chance, not guaranteed, it, this stuff is incredibly hard to know, but if you're just training something by trial and error and that thing becomes more capable than you and capable of, of accomplishing whatever goals it wants, there's a really good chance that you trained it to do something or trained it to pursue some goal that was like a sloppy, not quite right version of the thing you were trying to train it to do. And look, there's a lot of things that aren't humans that I think might be better than humans. Um, but a thing that's just kind of a sloppy, goofed up version of what a human was trying to train it to do is not really one of them. Um, and so I think that's, that's basically where I'm at. I do not think there's a guarantee. I don't think we definitely get AI systems out of this problem. I think it is a danger we need to be paying more attention to. I think that the track we're on right now is we've just got all these AI scientists and companies just saying, look, I built an even bigger model. This one's human brain size. And I you know, gave it rewards and punishments. And then it did all this stuff. And I have no idea how I did it. And, I, and I'm like, OK, well, if we just keep doing that and it works really well, then like we really could have a huge freaking problem on our hands. And we ha could have these beings we created that are just a sloppy, screwed up version of what we were trying to do filling the galaxy and running the world. I think we, we got to avoid that. It's not a thing I'm saying is guaranteed to happen. It's a thing I'm saying is not getting enough attention. Um, and so I'm not, I, I don't really want to see more people rushing into AI until that's being contended with, until people are saying, we understand how big this risk is. We know how to measure it. We know how to assess whether it's coming. We know how to stop it if it's going to happen. And then, then I would start to feel better. I know that's a lot. This is a very complex topic. So, uh, you know, check out my blog. Sam, I, <laughs> you, I'm going to go to Sam and then in the back and then there. And then I think that might be it. And then, and then no. Yeah, OK. Uh, and then I, th I think we'll be at, at time. Um, Sam. Yeah, I had a quick question about the pasta, the 
economic growth hypothesis. I think where I, it loses me is the connection to the production in the real world. So yeah. you see, like, ability of AI to learn knowledge tasks incredibly well, but it doesn't mean that necessarily um, it will be able to construct the factory that it makes the plans to build. And even if another AI is in charge of selling it the materials, you still need to, like, logistically ship them and transport them. Like, we, we are very bad as a society at building core infrastructure, even with, like, intelligent minds leading the process and, like, a lot of funding. Um, so I think it's hard for me to see the same leap between knowledge, task, grasping, and then, like, having that the world suddenly run and robot trains carrying robots, leaping materials, and robots building everything. Yeah, I, I think that's a totally good point. I, I explicitly named it as the weakest part of the most important century case. I have, I have two blog posts called, like, Weak Point and the Most Important Century. This is one of them. Um, so I, I, I think it's a totally good point. It's one that I think about a lot. I think the, so I'm not, I'm not going to say like, oh, this is garbage. I think this is like a good point that might turn out to be true. I think the main counterpoint would be like you, A, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that we literally get infinite um, economy. What we do is we get like, we hit other limits. We have to hit other limits. Um, like things move as fast as, as they are bottlenecked by something else. And I think if the main bottleneck is something like, how fast can robot factories build like more computers or something that could just be like incredibly fast. Like you could easily get thousands of years of technological progress in 10 years, which is not the same as saying you get it infinite progress in a second. Um, but I, yeah, I basically think that you, you do not need to automate everything in the economy. Um, if you automate some like sub loop of the economy, like building better solar panels, which gets you more energy, which gets you, you know, the ability to build like more and better computers, then you use those to build better solar panels, et cetera. You could have a relatively small loop that just like ends up resulting in a crazy amount of like compute metal energy in a short period of time. And I think that could be enough to, for the kind of consequences I'm talking about. Um, but I think it's, it's a little bit up in the air and it's something that we, we have at some point, I think are gonna just write up in more detail. I'm, I'm just gonna take these three questions maybe all together and then we'll figure out how to answer them effect efficiently. Cool, yeah. I'll answer them all at once. Just um, what, well, first of all, I want to see if, uh, how do you think about human augmentation and where, where it could be a counterbalance to the you know, super intelligence running around the world. And then the second. Human what? Hum, um, augmentation. Augmentation. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then the second part of your question is <laughs> whether, uh, how, how would you, what's your take on the progress there? Whether is there any chance we could get there before the uh, super intelligence starts running around? Okay. Okay. And then in the back. How do you think about the second order effects of pushing for practical AI safety and also the idea of like a hardware overhang where like actually if you slow things down now and we have this large hardware overhang or if you make things safer now then you kind of prevent us from building an immune system that would kind of raise awareness and like prevent people from actually making them like more dangerous systems in the future. So how do you think yeah. about that kind of second order effect? Cool. Okay. And then Noam left, so <laughs> I will get his question from him later. And then we'll stop there and then just yeah. hang out and chat. Well these are both these are both questions about like how, how fast things are coming and how, how fast we want them to come. Uh, my current view is like there's a good enough chance that we only have like ten or twenty years that I'm I'm kinda hoping that's not the case because I just think that in many ways the world isn't ready. Like no one takes these issues seriously, no one is talking about them. I think like the growth in the set of people who do take them seriously is like a lot faster actually than even the growth in AI research. So I feel like I feel like time is our friend for now. Um, I'm way less confident that I would like, you know, that I would think that like AGI or transformative AI in 2060 is worse than, 20, than 2080, I don't know. Um, and, and that also, you know, the human augmentation stuff. I mean, this is super intelligence discusses like various ways that humans could be made more intelligent by like merging with machines or doing other stuff. Um, and I think that stuff is just like, yeah, if we're, if we're talking about transformative AI in like the 2100s, that becomes maybe an interesting part of the picture. Uh, my sense is that it's like not really going to be a major factor if we're talking about the next 10 or 20 years or probably even the next like few decades. So that's, that's my main take and that's where I'm most focused now. Okay, we'll cut it there, but I do wanna ask the final poll. Um, same questions, yeah. just whether you have changed your opinions on this. Question one of, has anybody increased the degree to which they think they should work on or owe a moral obligation to the people of the 2200s rather than the people today. Put your hand up if you think that has increased for you throughout the talk. Oh, no. <laughs> Put your hand up if that has decreased for you during the talk. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, um, 
Uh, your probability of extinction. Okay, so put, put your hand up if that has increased, the probability of extinction. <laughs> and decreased? Okay. Um, and the last one, I'll skip the third one, was uh, your belief in like that we should use sort of effectiveness-based principles behind charitable giving. Put your hand up if that has increased during this talk and decreased during the talk. All right, that's like, it was a good, it was a good bag of results. All right, so okay. thank, thank you, everybody. Your mind. Yeah. It's only an hour. You wanna, yeah. I mean, it's a useful hour. Yeah. Um, Holden, thank you so much. Yeah, so. thanks, everyone.